right, wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. Bonsoir. On behalf of myself and the OpSense team, uh, many of whom are joining us this evening, including our CEO, Louis Laflamme, we warmly welcome you to tonight's webinar. First off, let me begin by introducing myself. My name is Ashley Farrell. I'm a marketing manager on our Structural Heart team. A little bit of our background as a company, OpSense is a Canadian-based company located in Quebec City with a long history of innovation in sensor technology. Our proprietary Fidela sensor is a second-generation fiber optic sensor and is used in Abiomeds and Pelopump and is also the true cornerstone of the OpSense portfolio. Our flagship product you may know is the OptiWire. It is the most accurate FFR wire with the lowest drift in the industry and has been used in over 100,000 patients worldwide. This year, of course, has been super exciting for us. Uh, using that same fiber optic Fidela sensor, we've expanded our portfolio to include an innovative new wire for structural heart procedures, launching our Savvy Wire. You know, until now, many of the, in the, in the innovations, excuse me, that we've seen in the Taver space have centered around valve and delivery systems, but the Savvy Wire is, is really more than a wire. It's providing a sensor-guided Taver solution and has key capabilities to deliver efficient and predictable outcomes. With uh, Health Canada approval in April and FDA clearance in September of 2022. Savvy Wire has been used in nearly 700 cases already and counting. So tonight we are very grateful to have an esteemed panel uh, with us. So Dr. Philippe General, Dr. James Farby, and Dr. Rahul Sharma here will review their experience with the Savvy Wire and share their best practices, honing in on the efficiency and LV pacing with the Savvy Wire. With that, at this time, I'm truly honored to introduce Dr. Genero from Morristown Medical Center, uh, who performed the very first Savvy Wire procedures in the US. Uh, Dr. Genero, please kick us off. All right, thank you so much, Ashley. And uh, I wanna first thank Opsense Medical to make it uh, possible. And uh, I wanna thank all the attendee to be here and my esteemed panel. Um, today, we're gonna review uh, during the next hour, uh, what is the Savvy Wire and how to use it and how the Savvy Wire can optimize uh, our Tiber procedure uh, per se. Um, I'm Philippe Genereux. I work at the Gagnon Cardiovascular Institute at Morristown Medical Center, interventional cardiologist, and I will be uh, with my two uh, good friends uh, and, and colleague, uh, Dr. James Harvey from York Hospital and Raul Sharma from uh, Stanford. Uh, this is what we're going to do today. First, I'm going to review uh, uh, the big picture, the feature and the benefit and a little bit of clinical data about the SAVI wire. Then we're going to uh, talk about the best practice of LV pacing because the savvy wire uh, is also a wire that we help to pace in the left ventricle. So James Arbe will help us uh, with that. And then we're going to uh, summarize a key points and learning uh, how to use it and what is the uh, clinical impact of hemodynamics with uh, Raul Sharma. So first, um, let's talk a little bit about what is the savvy wire. So the savvy wire is uh, what, what they call more than a wire. So it's really three uh, function in one wire. Uh, first, it's a workhorse wire uh, with very good performance, a stiff wire to deliver valve. Um, and it's a workhorse wire that we can use with any type of valve, sapien, core valve, balloon valvoplasty, et cetera. And the two key feature actually of the wire is first the sensor that is embedded at the tip of the wire. Uh, and it's uh, the Fidela uh, technology and the same sensor that we have in the Abiomed, for example. And the second feature is the pacing capability. So it's really the only and first approved LV pacing wire um, to pace and it's nicely insulated to improve uh, the, uh, the pacing cap capability. So this is uh, our device. So first it's pre-shaped uh, with a nice uh, little uh, curl, uh, curve at the end. Um, this is clearly the first wire to have a sensor embedded, a fiber optic sensor uh, in the LV. So we can have a continuous LV pressure. Um, it's O35, same as any uh, other uh, wire. It's a little bit longer than uh, other wires, 280 in length. So to uh, ensure pacing capability and, and a nice exchange of the valve. Uh, it's a nice color, uh, hard to miss, uh, bright orange. Uh, with a PTFE uh, sleeve, the coating, which actually increased the conductivity uh, of the wire for pacing. Uh, key uh, is the Fidela sensor at the tip uh, of the wire. 
Uh, and then you have the optical connectors, very similar to your opto wire um, in FFR. So simply connect at the uh, this at the um, proximal end uh, to have your reading. So this is an example of the first in Newman that uh, uh, that that was done in in Quebec in Montreal. This is a case by Joseph Rodez Cabot. Regular wire. What I really like about this wire is it's very stiff in the arch, so allowed uh, very easy crossing. Um, can recall actually the need for balloon valvoplasty with this wire, very stiff in the annulus, which is great for horizontal aorta um, and very stable for valve deployment. Um, so you put the wire at the tip of the apex as usual uh, and give a, a very great stability. So um, this wire has been used with all the different valve available. Uh, as you can see here, this is the sapien and now we also have the core valve. Uh, we use uh, so far we have used uh, the wire in more than 200 cases and we did portico, we did evil loot, uh, we did sapien, uh, valvuloplasty and uh, this is you can see here the family of evil 26, 29 and also 34. So remember the 34 a little bit more unstable uh, and I believe this wire is perfect for this valve uh, because it's a little stiffer in the arch than other and offer great stability for the um, evil flex at 34. So. All the valve have been used with this wire with great success and great stability. Um, in parallel, we did a, a little study of 20 patients. We did this at, at Morristown Medical Center where we use the opto wire from Opsense and use the same console with the, the software uh, of the savvy wire. And you, we try to compare what is the measurement of the gradient uh, derived by the savvy wire compared to two pigtail. We know the two pigtail used to be the gold standard for, to measure the gradient through the valve. So what we did, we did 20 patients consecutively and we did, we calculate the gradient before the TAVR with the two pigtail and the absence wire. And we compare um, to the two pigtail and we did the same thing post TAVR uh, with the pigtail, the two pigtail compared to the uh, absence wire. And what we saw actually, both before and after the TAVR, both gradient were at an excellent cor correlation uh, almost perfect before and uh, excellent after. So very good correlation uh, with uh, the two pigtail, which uh, eliminate the need for two pigtail in my mind. And we published this in JSKIA uh, last year. This is a type of uh, um, um, output you're going to have, and you can have this on your big screen, um, is the compare screen. We can see here we're going to have the ventricular pressure, the aortic pressure, and you're going to have the gradient, and you can customize your screen to have the peak-to-peak, -peak, the mean gradient or the, or the max gradient. Obviously, you're going to have the heart rate, the pulse rate, uh, and also uh, in certain geographies such as Australia, Canada, you're going to have the uh, aortic regurgitation index, and Dr. Sharma will talk more about that. And what I really like is you can export this in a very nice display for the referring doctor or um, to put in the chart. Um, and you have a nice pre and post comparison, which is very nice. Um, and I know JMRV and Raul do a lot of live case. It's also very nice for, for this. So in summary, this wire is three in one function in my mind. First, very good to deliver the valve, very good property. Actually, we the Savvy Wires was built on all the learning of all those non-dedicated wire that we had before. Um, great hemodynamics, so it's very important, especially when we go to complex case, bicuspid, valve and valve and young patient to have accurate hemodynamic to improve outcome. Uh, and LV pacing, which as we're going to see, uh, Dr. Rabi will, will inform us on, on this. LV pacing is, uh, is probably the new way to optimize TAVR. You, you don't have, you don't need RV pacing. Uh, and this is the uh, first wire and only wire to be approved by the FDA to precisely pays the LV without RV pacing. Where I see at least the, the fit of the savvy wire for sure, uh, LV pacing is great to optimize the uh, minimistic approach. Uh, valve and valve for me, it's important. Do you need to frack? Do you need to post dilate? Um, it's very important, can really impact uh, our, our, our next step. Uh, I believe complex anatomy, and I included severe LVOT calcium, bicuspid, small annulus, where we really want to know what is the gradient before and after, and do we need to post dilate or not? Uh, use it uh, in all the balloon valvuloplasty, which is very uh, streamlined the the, core, the the performance of valvuloplasty. And for in the future, aortic regurgitation assessment, I think that would be key uh, to help inform if we should stop or or, or post dilate. 
So that was a brief overview. Now we're going to uh, switch gear and I'm going to ask my uh, colleague, Dr. Jim Harvey, to take control. Uh, and he's going to talk about how to uh, perform and the best practice of LD pacing with the SIDI wire. So James, all yours. Thank you so much, Philippe. I really appreciate it. And I also want to thank everyone from Opsons for uh, for including me here today. It's a real privilege. And also for having us let us use the wire. Um, I am uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist. I'm the vice president and chief medical officer for the Heart and Vascular Service Line at uh, York Hospital in Wellspan, and I'm the director of the Structural Heart Program. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about what uh, what the wire is. As Philippe said very nicely, we have you know it's this is right now the only FDA approved uh, on label unipolar left ventricular pacing device. Um, it has a built in the shaft insulation. This actually matters uh, because it makes it super easy. If you've ever done LV pacing without it and you're, you know, when you're trying to make sure it's covered, et cetera, this just makes it easy. And I, I think there's a, something worth noting here is that I I'm, was very lucky. I actually got to be on the advisory board for this a long time, I think four years ago, actually. And uh, I was arguing at the time that you need to have a pacing sensor on it because AI was more of an issue than it is now. And I was actually the skeptic of LV pacing. I can say that. So the fact that I'm talking about it means I was converted only by practice. Um, this is the first wire I ever LV paced with, and I uh, became a convert. So um, to that end, it eliminates RV access uh, for eligible patients. And we can talk a little bit about that. You can see here also that it gives, you know, you can see we're testing it for pacing ahead of time, obviously, but you can see that you're actually measuring the pressure while you do it in real time. And it's really easy to do that. So you can do this or you can pace over this wire in four steps. That's all you have to do. And I'm, I'm an interventionalist, so I like it simple. So the first, you're gonna obviously have to put the guide wire in contact with the LV cavity. That's very easy. Yes, there's a couple of check, there's a couple of checks you can do to see this. You want to see, you'll see the wire actually squeezing in the LV. Um, and or you can also just simply if you you know in the, in the cases we've done, if you simply advance it till you stop and it looks in the right position, it's gonna we've never had a loss of capture or any issue with that. I think one thing Philippe said I think really matters is that the wire, you know, the 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 design of the tension of the strength of it is very, very nice. And that we've used it in Edwards valves, we use it in Evolute valves. And truthfully, I was one of the original believers in cusp overlap technique, big believer in meeting a stiff wire. And this wire actually offers you the stability to do that. And what's more is it's designed correctly. I mean, I, I can say this and you know, I'm an equal opportunity skeptic with new equipment and you know, historically, I've used the double curve Lunderquist wire for Evolutes. I've done it on, on the past 500 of them. And But the reality is the tip's not designed perfectly, right? This is a remarkably forgiving tip, just like with a, with a Safari if you're used to it, et cetera. So you have the rigidity and the and the stability of a stiff wire with the safeness of that, of that uh, really forgiving uh, curve. So once you put it in contact with the myocardium, you put it says an alligator clip there. I would argue whatever you use for conduction, some you know you can actually use the same screw on that you would for a traditional balloon tipped RV pacer. But that will be attached. One is to the LV wire, of course, at one of the two places that were shown in the prior uh, picture, and the other is the sub Q tissue. And historically, what most people do is take like I'll tell you what we did. We took a uh, a micropuncture needle, put a little bend on it, buried it right into the skin, just into the sub Q tissue, and put a clamp on it. It actually, we've we've kind of evolved to a different technique. I'm going to show you. You don't have to do it, but we found it's easier to use the uh, the actual leads that surgeons put on the heart when you are uh, when they come out of the operating room to actually go through the chest wall. I'll show you that. So once you've got the wire in, you've got the clip on the wire. You've got the clip on the wire. The clip on the ground for the patient. You plug it in. You're ready to go now. So the, the part I'm going to focus on just here is the output. <clears throat> the reality is we've tested the capture on our own. And we've done it as low as five, et cetera, but we just put it on 20 milliamps. And I'll admit we used to do a more of a, a fancy walk down to see where the capture was, et cetera. Now our procedure is I put the wire in, I pace it 180 at 10. If it captures at 10, I put it in 20 and I know we're good. And I've yet to not have it, uh, I've yet to not have it do that. Uh, you can see the pacing rates here. Obviously there's, there's heterogeneity on, um, on what labs do across the country. I will tell you that uh, we, like most of you, obviously with a balloon expandable valve, we go for pulse obliteration around 180 to 200 until we see the minimal pulse pressure. And in truth, uh, I know that uh, for Evolute, a lot of people like to say controlled pacing. We pace it at 180 during the deployment as that as well to, to, um, to um, minimize the vertical instability of the valve. And so uh, this wire does that very well. So we've, we've actually paced it exclusively at uh, 180 beats per minute up to 200, I should say. 
Um, it does say the sensitivity is asynchronous. Yes, we do. Uh, we do have it to where it's not sensing or in the O category to where you know there's no detection. It's going to pace regardless of what the ventricle is doing, and that's what you want, obviously, during uh, LV pacing. So what data do we have on this? I told you I was a skeptic, and uh, and in truth, I was. Despite this data, which is actually quite good data, we have at least three trials looking at this, actually, um, four if you include uh, uh, Philippe's. But if you look at the easy Tavi trial, so this is actually looking at 303 patients, uh, and this was out of France, 10 sites in France, prospective multi-center, single-blinded, randomized control trial looking for superiority. The objective was to determine whether LV stimulation over a guide wire uh, reduced uh, procedure duration while maintaining efficacy and safety compared to with what we've considered the gold standard, RB pacing. If you just take a look at the right here, we'll just walk down the column. I'll tell you out of the gate that the only statistically significant themes are procedure, time, fluoroscopy, and cost. But it is interesting to know that procedural success with LV pacing, while no statistical difference with RV pacing, was 100%. It worked every time with every patient. Um, you can look that if you look at the mace with Taber, you see that again, you can't say anything about this. It's not statistically significant, but is it interesting to note that it's numerically less? All cause death, numerically less. Cardiac tamponade caused by a pacing wire, zero versus uh, 1% in the RV pacing. And if you go down to looking at procedure time, 48 minutes, so we're talking a seven minute difference on a procedure, 48.4 versus 55.6. And if you've ever seen a, a Taber done in France, they're not slow. So the fact that you can shave seven minutes off of that's very impressive. Fluoroscopy time is lower, as is the cost, obviously, mitigating or, or minimizing, not needing the cost of an RV pacer. So what about uh, the, uh, there's another study out of Erasmus, out of Rotterdam, the Lean Tavi trial. This was a registry um, uh, uh, looking at um, patients who received pacing on the wire when necessary, and uh, that was the plan, unless there was a high anticipated risk for conduction disturbance uh, post AVI, and this is based on the baseline EKG. If you look over here in the columns, you can see LV pacing, no pacing, or RV pacing. Now it's a registry, so obviously there was selection bias, but what I think this tells us is we're pretty good at picking, or at least operators are pretty good at picking. This was 672 patch patients who underwent TAVI between December or June 2018 and December 2020. Um, if you look over here, the 488 in the LV pacing versus 139 versus 45 in the RV pacing, you can see there's no statistical difference in valve embolization, but numerically lower with LV versus RV pacing. I'll admit the no pacing column is a little hard to interpret, but what it tells you is you're probably dealing with pretty, uh, pretty healthy patients in that category. You can see um, uh, need for a temporary pacemaker for no capture. You can see very low, no difference there. Uh, new high degree AV block, you can see it was lowest in the LV pacing, uh, so uh, under 10%, telling you that when we look at the EKG compared to 16 and 44%, we're, we're pretty good at picking who's going to be a problem, who isn't. Um, you're looking at temporary pacemaker left in, it was under, uh, under 1 in 20, and this was the first experience in doing this, and this wasn't the savvy wire, to be clear. Um, just going down to outcomes here, we'll just kind of rock it through these, looking at no difference in death. Any neurological event, interestingly, there was a statistical difference with the lowest being in LV pacing. Disabling stroke, also lower, only not statistically significant. New left bundle branch block, higher in the LV pacing there. New pacemaker, lowest category in the LV pacing. Uh, again, suggesting the ability of operators to predict who's going to be an issue compared to 20% and 47%. Length of stay was lower. It is interesting when you look at this and you say the length of stay four versus five versus six. I'd be surprised if anyone listening here has a length of stay longer than two and it's probably closer to one or maybe even just below one. So uh, it tells you that this was done in 2018 to 2020. But but either way, I think the data is pretty strong signal saying that it's it's reliable. Arguably, it is the new gold standard. Um, lastly, we'll look at specifically to the savvy wire. This was the first in human study actually um, looking at, uh, this is Dr. Joseph uh, rodas Cabot and Dr. Ibrahim out of Canada, 20 patients, the inclusion criteria you had to have severe, uh, uh, it's an asymptomatic case, I thought it was symptomatic case actually, exclusions, extremely calcified valve, extremely horizontal, and a little septal hypertrophy, things you would want to make sure that you were going to be able to navigate, um, extreme access, tortuosity, prohibitive surgical risk. You're looking at safety, absence of major complications related to the guy wire, and obviously efficacy. Are you going to get an effective uh, pacing capture, and are you going to get accurate ventricular pressures within five millimeters of the pigtail catheter? And I would argue from the data that came out of uh, Philippe's lab that uh, we'd have to question which the gold standard is now. Is it the pigtail catheter or the wire? 
so what did we find? All cause death, zero, strokes, zero, uh, major vascular, again, 20 patients, but a remarkably good signal for 20 patients. A rapid pacing capture failure, zero, successful implantation, 20. Guide wire kink, malposition, embolization, need for a second valve, all zero. Again, 20 patients, but a wonderful first signal uh, coming out with this wire. So uh, I'm gonna change gears a little bit and talk just about how we actually do it in our lab and let you know, our experience, like everyone's, is fairly new because it's a fairly new uh, wire. That being said, uh, we're rapidly learning ways, like any lab. Uh, you know, if you're not if you're not efficient with it, uh, it's you know both for the operators and for the team, it's going to be dead in the water, and that that hasn't been the case at all for us. So this is actually the pacing. There's a pacing lead that goes into uh, when someone has cardiac surgery. So if you take this, um, you take this uh, right. If you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. But if you follow back from the needle all the way back to the um, to this little, it looks like a piece of frayed uh, cover over this. It actually is frayed material off, and there's exposed wire under there. You drive the, the the needle through, you pull to the exposed parts in, and you pull it back. I'll show you. Now in surgery, you actually take this end, the needle, the long straight needle, and you punch it through the chest wall. You break off this. The it's a break readily breakable, and you you have your your. Uh, um, your electrode are essentially the place to connect uh, with the pacing lead. I only put this on here to show you uh, that uh, that it wasn't my idea. I wish it was. My colleague Ronson Matafil was the one who thought of it. He goes, you know what? You should use what we use in the OR. I said, well, what's that mean? Well, I'll tell you what we do. You can see here, this is just simply taking the, the, the suture, the needle, driving it through just like you see here. <clears throat> the next thing we do is we'll actually pull it through. And I don't know if you can see it, but it pulls through till there's an exposed piece of wire without insulation, and then that frayed area. And then what you do is you just pull it back snug and that fray actually keeps it from coming out. We decided to do this because, you know, yes, we're all trainable, but I'll admit, I keep trying to pull the needle out that I see on the table, uh, like one of Pavlov's dogs. So we actually just did this. This takes all of about 48 seconds to do. It gives you real stability and safe. Uh, and then once you do that, you can see we're actually, you're actually pulling on the wire and it actually doesn't let it come through unless you pull really hard. So once we do that, we hook the alligator clip up to the end, just like Philippe had showed, and then we, we hook the other end up. I wish I had it a little closer there, but uh, we have the other end right up to the other end of that electrode, as you saw, and now you're ready for business. Again, this whole thing takes us less than less than a minute. So I show, this is, a, a, this is a, one of our cases with it, and I, I brought it up as a specific example. This is a patient who had a area of 740 738, 40 millimeters, so large. We were putting in a 29 S3 plus four. And I'll tell you this, anyone who does this knows, and as I say that, you cannot lose pacing. So it tells you my faith in this wire compared to someone who was, was uh, tried and true in RV pacer and I was a convert on it. So <clears throat> one other thing worth noting, uh, my practice has become that unless they're a bad EF or something, I'll typically do rapid pacing just for the injection because I find that the dye stagnates in the column a little bit more. So you can see here, I just did a hand injection. I thought it was good enough to see it, but once I put the savvy wire in and uh, I, I just did a quick rapid pace and it does it does pace as well. And with the wire in every case we do, it does, we don't, you know, if you have the valve across, you lose it all, all the dye to AI. With the wire across, really, you typically don't have any issues. So if you're someone who does inject on rapid pacing, you can do it with a wire in position. So similar to uh, what was just shown before, you can see this is for valve positioning, just like we normally do. Um, again, this is a 740 millimeter valve, so we can't lose capture here. We thought this position was pretty good. Um, and then for valve deployment, similarly, uh, we have the wire in, we see that's in the ventricle, we pull the pig there and just did a nice slow inflation. And you'll notice that we don't miss a beat. We don't have, we have complete stability uh, and we needed to have complete stability for this case and, and it deployed very well. A couple of things worth noting here. One, you know, it's not a particularly horizontal aorta, but you can see the ventricle is pretty horizontal. This wire offered excellent stability in this situation. Secondly, we do make a note to make sure that we're not pulling the wire you know, we don't put forward pressure on it, but just have a little passive hold on it to make sure it doesn't back up. That's the only extra step we do. And so you can see on the left, I, you know, I really, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we check hemodynamics on everybody. We often don't do it because of time. Let's be honest. Um, I, I can tell you the second I see this, I know we don't have significant AI. Yes, we look with a trans thoracic afterwards, but the second we do this, uh, we have, we hook up the wire, we know that we're good. And I'll tell you also, um, this is this might have been the first time we did it. I, I, I tried to get the sound off, and then I thought, ah, eh, we'll leave the sound on. 
uh, because uh, it tells you that this is really how easy it is with our excellent uh, reps there, Dan and team explaining this there. So you see, we pull it back to zero it and just push it right back in. And there it is. It's literally that long to zero it and be ready to go if you hadn't zeroed it ahead of time. So this is instant real time that, that uh, really anticipates the impatience of an interventional cardiologist. Uh, so with that, I'll tell you that 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 LV pacing with the Savvy Wire is safe. It is effective and it is easy to learn, not just for the operator, but for the team. And if you've ever tried to bring IVIS into a new lab or IFR or DFR or FFR, you know if the team doesn't like it, it's going to be it's going to be a nightmare to implement. Our team loved it after the first case. It takes less time, that's why less RV pacing. It saves an access site, offers immediate and accurate real time LV pressure tracing and can be safely used. We're learning more and more with a large majority of patients uh, for TAVR. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over uh, to Dr. Sharma. Great, thank you, James. That was fantastic. And uh, again, reiterate your appreciation to the OpSense team. I'm a relatively new uh, member of the team. Um, I have not been involved for a long time. And I, like James, was also very much a skeptic of LV pacing. And uh, it's actually credit goes to Philippe. Um, I have immense respect and admiration for Philippe. So when he called me up and told me about this wire that he was using with great success, I thought if it's good enough for Philippe, it's certainly good enough for me. So I give all credit to him for my recent uptake um, of the wire at, at my practice. So I'm an interventional cardiologist. I um, run the structural heart program at Stanford. I'm also the co-director of the cath lab. And so for me, the impact of this both clinically in terms of the hemodynamics um, was important, but also the case workflow. We're obviously a tertiary academic institution. We have a number of trainees. In addition to our interventional and structural fellows, we also have cardiothoracic residents, interns and fellows. And so to me, anything that adds additional steps to the already added steps as part of being a teaching program um, is really not ideal. So I was very excited um, when I learned that this could improve the workflow. Uh, I can't advance the slides from my end. I'm going to stop sharing on mine, but I think if you take over, it'll take it. I'll reshare the slides. One moment, please. So, Dr. Sharma, once I share the slides, if you can, <clears throat> excuse me, look for the button that says take control, you should have access. But if you don't, then I can help advance for you. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Take control. Got it. Perfect. Can you see that? Wonderful. Yes. OK, terrific. So let's start with continuous hemodynamic measurement. Uh, James alluded to this earlier, but just to take a little bit of a deeper dive. So my current workflow, at least prior to using the OpSense wire, was I was checking gradients pre and post every case. It was a legacy effect of being involved in the partner trials, and I continued that into my commercial practice. And so that required an exchange of catheters, you know, crossing the valve, doing a pre-gradient, putting in a pigtail catheter or another end hole catheter, flushing everything up, making sure everything was calibrated appropriately, re-zeroing if you're used to using the expert system, all of these steps done pre and as well as post. Now we get the immediate hemodynamic feedback as soon as our wires across. And then based on the result, in addition to some of the other optic cues that we get um, in terms of the difficulty crossing the valve, the decision can be made now with the help of the hemodynamics to consider a valve predilatation without exchanging that catheter. So that's kind of the first step in terms of the benefit practically of getting those immediate hemodynamics. And you can see there that illustration to the left where the savvy wire pressure sensor sits uh, relative to the aortic valve pigtail. And you can see on the tracing on the right, what we're all used to seeing from any sort of invasive hemodynamics, a very clear delineation there between the aortic pressure and the LV pressure with the shaded area representing the gradient. So the other interesting aspect of this has been aortic regurgitation, particularly residual regurgitation, um, either after ballooning or for that matter, placing a valve. And there's been a lot of literature to calculate the ARI or the aortic regurgitation index. And so the index basically decreases as aortic regurgitation or for that matter, paravalvial leak increases. So the lower the AR index, uh, the sorry, the higher the degree of leak, the lower the ARI. And so less than 25 um, across a number of publications has been associated with adverse clinical outcomes, including mortality out to one year. And so it's helpful when we're assessing PVL uh, in terms of its severity 
A lot of people will do a contrast injection, but we know that sometimes patients won't tolerate the additional contrast load. We don't necessarily want to give extra contrast. And then there's also the impact of the force with regards to the pressure uh, that we're delivering the contrast with, whether you create iatrogenic aortic regurgitation or perivalvular leak, and how much of that is real versus a result of the force of the injection. So here, I think we get a very objective measure of the degree of PVL. You can see there that the ARI in the first tracing on the uh, upper part of the left side of the screen demonstrates no PVL, whereas on the bottom illustration, the ARI is clearly less than probably 25 to 30 there, uh, in con consistent with moderate PVL. In terms of the workflow, um, and that's really been the big part of this, I think the hemodynamics are important. I'm, I'm clearly a big believer in doing gradients pre and particularly post invasively, and it's a whole topic unto itself about the importance of invasive hemodynamics and clinical outcomes. But as I mentioned before, for my practice, really a big part of this was the workflow and maintaining or ideally improving efficiency, and that's exactly what I've noticed. And so this is the typical workflow here. Uh, we have the pigtail in the uh, aorta. Obviously, as James pointed out, we now no longer need venous access and a temporary pacer. Um, I know some people initially at the start, because they were a little unsure about the stability of the wire and the consistency of pacing, were putting in a temporary pacing wire as a backup. I don't have that in place. It's just the LV pacing wire. There's no venous access whatsoever. There's certainly no temporary pacing wire. So extruding that wire outside of the pigtail is important. Obviously, like any wire exchange, you want to do it carefully and safely. I liken the stiffness of the savvy wire to somewhere between a safari and a, and a confida wire. Um, it sort of sits between the two in that sweet spot of appropriate stiffness to provide stability, but not so stiff uh, that you risk any injury to the LV. It's important to balance the forces as you're extruding that, uh, that savvy wire through the pigtail. Uh, for me, it's just simply pulling back the pigtail gently as I advance the uh, savvy wire gently making sure it sits at the apex nicely, removing the pigtail catheter and trying to maintain guide wire position as we're so used to doing in any of these structural cases. Like any type of deployment, you wanna maintain the position of that guide wire. That's important, not just in terms of safety with potential laceration of the LV, but also the fidelity of the signal when you're doing a hemodynamics and also for maintenance of capture of, of that unipolar pacing. So you just wanna make sure what you're always doing, keeping that wire in the appropriate place. Then we want to connect the black end, as James showed us, of the temporary pacing alligator clip to the back of the savvy wire, and then the red end to your grounding needle or the modified version that James showed us from his practice to make sure that we ground that unipolar pacing. We connect the savvy wire to the handle, making sure everything's flushed if you've particularly done a contrast injection beforehand, and get that pre-recorded pressure. We then at that point test our pacing threshold. Everyone does this a little bit differently. I set the mode to VOO's asynchronous pacing. Um, we generally set the rate to at least 20 beats per minute above the patient's intrinsic rates. There's no competition. Um, I generally set it at the max output and then very quickly decrease the output um, in increments very quickly of five um, down to 10 or loss of capture, whichever occurs first. Generally, it is uh, maintaining capture at 10 and then cranking it all the way back, back up to 25. I always remind my staff we're not testing thresholds on a permanent pacemaker implantation. There's no need to walk this down in millimeter increments. Um, and so we very quickly do that, ensure that there's capture. And I will say to date, we've had no issues um, with the pacing test. And uh, then we insert the valve delivery system as is routine over the savvy wire, reconnect the handle uh, and then the black alligator clip to the back of that uninsulated wire, maintaining the position of that savvy wire. I will add that it's very important to keep the entire system flushed. Um, the coating on the savvy wire, if you're not flushing it as you insert it and maintaining a flush system, can cause a little bit of friction. And so you just want to make sure you, as a practical point, you keep everything flushed. Um, rapid, your rapid pacing, whatever rate you like to do. I also like to do 180, the max output of 25 milliamps, uh, and then deploy the valve as appropriate, maintain the position of that wire. And you can see there on that tracing, this is an example of full capture with unipolar LV pacing. After the procedure is done, you remove the valve delivery system, and now we want to do our post hemodynamics. So we pull the THV delivery system out to the aorta, and then we complete the equalization process by pulling the sensor in the aorta while maintaining the curve of the savvy wire. So we don't want to pull it back all the way across the valve, but it's very important to pull it back, and I'll show you in a subsequent slide where that marker is, so that we line it up with the pigtail in the aorta so that equalization can occur in the same uh, place in the ascending aorta. We want to utilize those waveform tracings to verify that the sensor is in fact in the AO, so you'll see a very distinct difference between the LV pressure, pressure tracing 
And then when you've pulled it back adequately, you'll see that it mimics the aortic valve tracing. So you know you've pulled back far enough and then equalize at that point with the sensor at roughly the same level as the aortic pigtail. Again, you wanna make sure everything's flushed up and then insert the savvy wire after you've equalized back into the LV uh, to make sure that you now can ascertain the true gradient. And if there is a little bit of a delay, you can adjust that if needed to try and superimpose the AO and the LV pressure tracings. So this is just an example here. Again, you wanna pull it back, but not so far that you pull it all the way across the valve. You press the equalize button to set the equalization. And you can see there on the left, the arrow pointing to where the savvy wire sensor is, and that's visible quite easily under fluoroscopy. So not only are you correlating it with the aortic pressure waveform, but you're also making sure that that marker is in line with the aortic pigtail. Once you've equalized and you're satisfied that equalization has occurred and there's good overlap, you then advance the savvy wire gently back into the ventricle and proceed with your post-stabber measurements. So clearly a big difference, you can see that there's no exchanges here, there's no catheters being replaced over stiff wires, there's no multiple disconnections, flushing and reconnection. So in addition to the efficiency of it, there's also an element of safety. I always think quite simply, the more steps, the more potential for introducing error. So for here, we're reducing steps from access to exchanges to flushes, uh, which to me, in addition to the efficiency piece is also reducing uh, overall introduction of error. And so we do the post-operative recording, measuring those post-implant hemodynamics with those pressure tracing. And then depending on what we see, either deciding to do a post dilatation um, or a further assessment as needed. And then we label the post gradients with the notes and display those results on the compare screen, which you'll see here, which is quite nice and side by side. We can see the pre gradients in this particular case example and the post gradients displayed side by side. And I will say, at least in our um, system, there's been a lot of issues with artifact and error with our expo monitoring system. And this takes a lot of that variance and heterogeneity out of the equation. So what are the keys for successful man uh, measurements? The wire positioning the valve is important. Um, sometimes, like any stiff wire, can interfere with leaflet opening or closing, particularly pinning it open. So you just want to verify on fluoroscopy that it's truly centered within the valve. Uh, pre tab it might help keeping the uh, stenosis leaflet open and decreasing the gradient, so you just want to keep that in mind. Um, and again, the opposite, it can prevent closure of a leaflet, tenting it open, causing regurgitation. So just gentle manipulation if that's suspected either of those situations to try and centralize the wire. Um, as mentioned, we want to flush everything, but particularly if a line has been moved, reconnected, or if you've inject ingested, injected rather contrast, you want to make sure that that's not providing some sort of artificial gradient, particularly the contrast or blood. And so making sure everything's adequately flushed. And then if there is an issue with recording, sometimes the wire can cause a little bit of ectopy. So you might want to make some subtle adjustments, allow for stability in the electrical activity, and then try and pick a segment of clean beats without those artifacts, without premature ventricular contractions, and average over multiple beats where possible. And then, as I mentioned before, if there is a delay, you can make that subtle adjustment of the waveform. And so in summary, I mentioned some of these. Overall, we're reducing the number of devices, replacing the traditional TAVA guide wire, replacing at least one transducer, replacing the venous access kit, the need for an RV pacing wire, and if you use it, a closure device for that RV um, venous access. It supports the case efficiency, so there's obviously reduced transducer setup time, at least again in our situation, re -zero zeroing multiple times because things just don't seem to add up. It eliminates that venous access and device exchanges on that side. And then of course, minimizing the exchanges of catheters and the flushes associated with getting the pressure readings pre and post. And then finally, I think it enhances the procedural predictability. I think we've all experienced when you do enough cases, the loss of capture with RV pacing. Um, some of us have experienced, with, again, when you do enough cases, perforations related to RV pacing. Here we have continuous accurate measurement. We have display of the hemodynamic pressures at all times and minimizes the risk of RV pacing complications. I'll stop there and we can open up the panel discussion. All right, James, Raul, thank you so much for a great presentation. and. Um, now we're going to open for a panel discussion and just uh, want to mention so for the audience, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A uh, chat box. Um, and um, we're going to start uh, just by summarizing, summarizing the advantage of the SABI wire and then we can talk freely after. But um, for me, it's, it's, it's well, it's all about efficiency. Um, we, we learned a lot from the 3M group in Vancouver and they tried to minimize actually the step of the tabber, but I think this is the quintessence of efficiency, um, really to make it predictable uh, and, and efficient and, and, and improve outcome actually, as a matter of fact. So 
One thing that was mentioned, the RV pacing. Um, when you will look at the loss of capture, probably is more unstable with the movement, the breeding, et cetera, and, and sometimes associated with more complication, not on, only at the level of the RV by itself, but also vascular access. It always annoys me when I get venous access and try to put my wire and the pacemaker goes in little branches. And, and this is where I think when you have a lot of bleeds occurring, and which is uh, could be really annoying um, by itself and take time. Um, so the time for floating the RV pacing, again, we, we do taver and sometimes it's below 20 minutes, but a lot of time it's taking sometimes two, three minutes to float the RV pacing, sometimes more. So it's not only annoying, but uh, it's time consuming. It's maybe associated with complication. Obviously, the, the no need for RV ac uh, venous access is it, great. Since we switched to Savvy, you don't realize, but it's, it's really free you up and, 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 and get you back your time. Um, once you get into the routine and you get your movement in order, uh, it's really saved you time. Uh, we did Taver in, in, in literally 12 minutes uh, with the Savvy Wire, and I think it can save you by approximately 25% of your time of the Tavi, and, and I, I think I'm, I'm being conservative here. Um, the good thing about the wire is the insulation, and, and, and kudos to the lead engineer, uh, uh, Sebastian of uh, uh, Opsense, we we test the threshold because we want to learn about this wire. And when you have the catheter on top of the wire, the threshold will be around two or five. OK, so never been above five in, in my um, in my uh, ends. Uh, obviously, you need a good technique, which is you, I call it the two ends technique. When you hold the wire in the device and the right ends and gently forward pressure and you have the left hands on the catheter and the sheet and gentle forward pressure. So when you LV pays uh, and you use this technique, the threshold will be below two. I get threshold of one sometime. So the threshold is very low if you have a proper technique and proper uh, positioning. Um, obviously, one thing I like is when you do valvuloplasty, for example, is you have the, the, the gradient live. Uh, and so you don't have to remove all your catheter and do a lot of brain passage, uh, as I call. When you remove catheter and pigtail and new devices, you have maybe six or eight brain pass, uh, and, and that's increased the risk of stroke. So I think if you have the connector, the pressure right away, uh, it, it's really uh, make the case easier and much more fun, actually. Um, so I, I think for, for, for us, it became the, the, the standard of care. Um, and I think the fact that we have display of the pressure in front of us really also increase the, um, the, the ease of use, but also the fun to do a case. So I'm going to stop there um, and I'm going to welcome a question from the panel. Um, and um, if there's no question, um, if there's one question from the audience here, um, the question is, uh, do you feel that this wire could be used for every case um, and why it will not be used in any case. So I'm going to start by answering that I'm using it in every case. Uh, there's maybe one case, one type of case where um, we still have to learn is uh, the super small hyperdynamic LV. So this 91 years old female with a cavity is banging, there's gradients of valvular. Uh, to be quite honest, I think all the wire could be potentially dangerous. Um, this is where maybe a self-expendable valve is better, uh, where you don't put too much pressure on the system. Uh, but I would say for 95% of the case, for me, um, uh, it will be a good wire. Um, to have a wire with a smaller, smaller pigtail might be uh, the solution for this very small hyperdynamic wire uh, LV. I don't know, Raul or James, if you have an opinion about those very small LV uh, that are hyperdynamic, I think is an issue with everything. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm using it for every case, um, but yes, in a small hyperdynamic LV, um, it's like any wire, you get a lot of irritation. And it's just, again, like wire management, you just want to be very careful with maneuvering it excessively. But yes, having a small wire would be great. I used to use the Amphites Extra Stiff and put my own curve on it prior to the Savvy wire. So definitely you lose a little bit of that flexibility, but it's the minority of cases. So, so James, what is your... Uh... Your opinion on that? 
So I'd say the same that, you know, it's a, I think the curve is a, is a well-designed curve for most cases. As you know, there's no one size fits all. And so I suspect Sebastian is listening. And so there's probably a smaller curve coming out down the road. Uh, I, I have a question for you because you have more experience with this than I do. And so I was paying attention to the question from uh, Brian from the audience. And that was that, the you know, when I deploy an Evolute valve, I, I, I actually will use it for every Bloom expandable, every everyone. When I deploy, when I do the final release on an Evolute valve, I typically pull the wire back solely because in my hands, if there's inadvertent tension on an Evolute catheter, it's coming back. And I've never had this happen, but I've seen cases of the nose cone yanking out and catching a hold of the cage. So my traditional practice is to pull back the wire such that the nose cone is no longer, you know, resting against the, the outer curve uh, in potential contact with the valve. How do you navigate that uh, since you've, you've had a lot of experience with this? Yeah, so that's a good question. If you want to keep wire position, which we like, what I've been doing, I pulled the wire in the nose cone, okay? And I pulled back the nose cone through the valve. And I know when I have the leaflet level, I start to advance the wire and keep retracting the nose cone. So there's a gentle maneuver. And, you know, again, we learn to, this is a new device. It's not only a wire, um, it's, it's a new device. So you learn how to navigate this. So for the core valve, for example, exactly what you said, how do you remove the core valve without banging the, uh, the, the inner curvature or the, the uh, outer curvature is really by pulling back the wire. But when the, the nose cone is really through the valve, then you start to re-advance by pulling. Uh, without damaging the leaflet so that that's will be uh, that was my uh that is my practice um i use mainly balloon expendable but in, in, in some cases where i use self-expendable this is what we do one one um situation um that may be a pain point for the lv pacing is when patient has a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block people say well i'm afraid uh, i want to have my rv pacing because if there's av block so uh, in Europe, um, they move away from, um, from, from RV pacing completely. Um, I, I have an algorithm when I have, for example, a big fat right bundle branch block, 160 QRS. Um, I still use uh, the, the side wire, but I put a neckline, okay, just in case, because the last thing you want to do is to have it put a neckline in the middle of a, 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 a AV block. Very important, if you have an AV block, uh, during the savvy wire, is, it's not a problem. You just keep pacing on the wire, the LV wire, you back up your system. And the key here is you have, you can pace from the extremity, but also from the middle of the wire. So you go to the extremity, you pace, you remove your device, you pace on the wire in the middle, and then you put your, your, your temporary pacemaker. Most of the time, after two, three minutes, the AV block tends to, re, to, to resolve. So I think this is maybe one situation where you just need to know if you had a right bundle, a big right bundle, or a big left bundle, or six sinus with the right QRS, um, I, we put a, a neckline or a venous line in the femoral, uh, but we put, don't put the pacemaker, the TVP right away, and you can pace on the wire. So you need to be um, to be aware of that and ready. This is a new approach, so I think this is a reduce the surprises. So I don't know if James or uh, Raul, this thing happened to you and how you navigate that. I, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I will tell you, we haven't had it yet. That's obviously your big concern, and and we kind of walked through what it would be. Um, so, I, in fact, I could see this relates to one of the questions from Andrew uh, saying, are you hesitant to use it if you want to keep a transvenous pacemaker over And I think this ties in nicely in that 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 our I will tell you our 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 pacer rate's pretty low. It's a, it's a you know right around five percent, but uh, but but if we were to in that situation, we need to let me answer this this way. The efficiency we've we've gained by doing this, yes, you have a PR interval of 260 and a big right bundle. We're going to put a transvenous pacemaker in because the odds are overwhelmingly high that you're going to want to put one in, if nothing else to observe. But the the efficiency gained and the time savings gained for the we haven't been wrong yet, but we'll, there'll be a case where we go into complete heart block using this, and we'll need that, and we don't have a pacer in. And so in that situation, then we've already got it worked out. We already have the exocyte plan. We're just going to stick go. Continue to calmly pace over the wire and put your transvenous pacemaker in. So uh, that, we haven't had it yet, but our plan is just as you described. Yeah, I agree yeah. completely. Same, same here is exactly what James uh, sort of described. The, the only thing I'd add, um, perhaps a little unrelated, is for those that are starting to use this or, or about to use it. Um, the I know some of my colleagues who've used it. Their initial uh, issue or difficulty was. Putting that, pushing that wire out of the pigtail. And it's, it does feel a bit different to some other wires coming out of the pigtail. 
And like anything, it's just expectation. And so once you know that there is that slight sort of push as you come out the pigtail and you're aware of it, it can just be managed quite easily. But I know a lot of people get that initial uh, resistance and they think, oh, something's wrong. It's stuck in the pigtail. I don't want to shove it out and, you know, perforate it. That's everyone's fear. But it's just, again, it's just knowing that you've got to pull the pigtail back as you advance the wire. And it does have a slightly different coating to it than the wires we're used to. And as I mentioned, that stiffness is somewhere between a, a, a safari wire and a confeder wire. I think, uh, yeah. agree. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, no, no, go ahead, James. I was going to say, it's interesting you point that out, Rahul. I thought the same thing. And that, I, in fact, I described that to Dan and Melissa, our reps in the case, saying, you know, the wire, it, like all things, is an interventionalist. How much of our life is feel, right? It's all feel. And uh, and I said, you know, the wire feels different. I said, like, it was a bad, not bad at all. Actually, it feels fine. It's just different. But you, you're exactly right. You, you, the insulation has a different feel. It's a very responsive tactile feel. But like everything else, you 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 learn it. So, yes, yeah, so I think um, I, I I try all the technique because I want to see the the wire uh, behavior in all the the situation. Um, I used to have AL1 crossed with a stiff wire, curl the AL1 in the apex, and exit my wire. This thing go well, but not very good for small hypertrophic ventricle. Then I went to my Columbia uh, technique where I learned uh, how to do Taver back in the day and. I think for me the best what I try everything pigtail AL1 and 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 now I I, I stop with the JR4. So my technique now is to use a JR4 six French cross the valve, um, and I like the JR4 because it's very small. And then I remove the wire when I'm, the JR4 is in the LVOT, and I go in the RAO and I just navigate the JR4 to the apex, and then I use uh, my savvy wire right away. This is the one no friction at all. And is the easiest way, and 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 I feel uh, this is where I feel the safest. L1 is easy to cross, but it's big when in the it's in the LV. You bang the septum, you 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 go under the pap. Uh, pigtail is a one more step, so I prefer to use a JR4 to cross. Put the JR4 in the apex RAO, exit the wire. I think that's the for me now after a couple. Uh, it, it's it's uh, the most streamlined uh, uh, way to go. Um, I will answer again the question related to the pacemaker. For me, there's two things. There's the procedure efficiency, the gradient, the LV pacing, which I think has a lot of benefit compared to RV pacing. Then there are these 24, 48 hours of uh, post-procedure observation. So both are totally disconnected in a way that um, you may do the procedure with a savvy wire for X, Y, Z reason, but of course you're going to have to observe the patient for uh, because the patient is iris of AM, AV block. So for me, when I know uh, I want to have, uh, uh, I will use a pacemaker uh, TVP because of the right bundle, I put it right away. I still use the uh, LV pacing because I love the gradient, I love the behavior, and I love uh, the pay LV pacing, which gives me more control uh, and more more acute drop of pressure. And then um, I, I, I remove everything and the pacer is there. So I think there's there's level to this. Uh, but I think the right bundle is, is, is you know, uh, if you don't want to play with fire, you put the TVP and you use the savvy wire for other reason. Um, one thing um, I would say that um, I've been using a lot is for balloon valvuloplasty. Um, James and, and, and Raul, any experience with this? I, I love for the va balloon valvuloplasty because it's given me a lot of flexibility and uh, and very, very efficient. So have you uh, have any experience with other procedure, uh, mitral tricuspidal balloon? Oh, so I was going to say, um, I have not as yet. I mean, as as you know, uh, Philippe, you know, we've moved away from doing a lot of standalone BAV. Um, mm -hmm. So just by a numbers uh, game, I haven't had any. And as I said, I'm, I'm kind of new to the technology. Uh, but I, I definitely see potential for it um, for the mitral, you know, uh, and, and also potentially for the tricuspid. You know, we a lot of the transcatheter replacements are delivered over safari wire. This has similar characteristics. It would be nice to have hemodynamics. But especially on the mitral when we're doing... Um, you know, TMVRs and even balloon valvuloplasties, um, it'd be nice to be able to have that that immediate uh, pressure measurement. That's great. Um, there's a question uh, from the audience called, if you, if you use a savvy wire, do you need to use the options wire? Well, um, I'm not going to answer directly for the vendor, but one thing that I like is uh, we have actually in all our room the console of the options wire and you can switch um, up the wire for the coronary and you switch the mode for, for TAVI. So very versatile. So for me, it's good to have all the room equipped with that. I can do BAV in one room, TAVR in three rooms. 
and FFR in the other room. So um, I think uh, I think that's um, um, that's very um, very efficient and versatile. So I'm going to try to finish on um, how should we do Taver in the future. And one of my vision of when I why I'm so excited about the savvy wire is because I like this image that we see where there's only there's only actually a valve and a wire and a pigtail. So the way I see this is, and I don't know where uh, James and Raul, you can uh, tell me what you think, but the, my vision is to use a savvy wire with a pigtail. And then we'd like the TT to confirm for the effusion or the stuff, but I see that the most optimal way to do this is uh, one arterial access, no vein, uh, one wire, and you have a TTE probe, you have a little like a sonocyte, you know, when you look at the end of the case yourself with a sterile condom and you can look for effusion. Uh, that's the way I see, you know, with nobody else around. Um, so that, a single operator technique uh, with one wire and one probe just to check for effusion. What, what is your, your vision of the most uh, um, slick and skinny um, uh, pattern? <clears throat> I think that five years from now, that's going to be what we're doing. And right now, it almost sounds like, what? Is he serious? And the truth is, that's probably going to be less than five years from now. So I agree completely. And uh, I'm also thinking about what you said last time. I did a transcatheter mitral last week, and I'm like, why didn't I use a savvy wire? <laughs> we weren't going to get heart block. That's a really good thought. So I'm glad you said that. And I also will say just that I I agree with you. There's still a real role for BAVs for us, and it's the perfect wire for it. When this wire was being designed, that's what it was for. But um, what in my mind was for BABs, and obviously there's far more need than that, but I would agree with you. That's what I see the future of most mainline stream tabby being. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we're trying to get more and more efficient and tools like this allow us to do so in a safe manner. Um, you know, we see a lot of stuff on Twitter and other media where people are trying to get a little too cute and, and cutting corners to save time in other areas which may not be safe. This is, I think, a very safe and effective way to become efficient. All right, so um, I think we're almost approaching the um, um, top of the hour. So I, I'm gonna so we're gonna stop here, but I just want to thank the uh, my two panel, James and Raul. Thank you so much for your time. I want to thank the Opsense medical team. Um, this is a wonderful gift for us to have this uh, this type of technology, and I'm sure you're gonna keep uh, innovating and pushing the boundary. But thanks for offering us something that really can help our patient. And thanks uh, to the audience um, for uh, tuning in with us. That's gonna be recorded, so you will be able to uh, play it again and again. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a good rest of your night. Thank you, Dr. General, and thank you to the panel and everyone for joining us this hour. It's been a it's been a great, uh, great presentation. Appreciate your time. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks so much. much.